This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 733, recorded on March 18, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. This is clinical update number 54. How's things going, Daniel? You know, I continue to be optimistic. Um, you know, as I was saying the other day, um, you know, that we, we've said over time, it's a, you know, it's a race, the vaccine against the virus. But, you know, the, the governors are doing everything they can to, to help out the virus. Right. So um, we we are doing everything we can to ramp up the vaccinations. And uh, I actually don't know if people heard, but there have already been over a hundred million vaccine doses um, given out in the United States. We haven't quite got to 100 million people fully vaccinated, um, but we are cranking through the vaccines. Um, I know a lot of our listeners, I don't know what percent at this point, um, are here on Long Island. Long Island has been a little bit of a vaccine desert, I have to say. But um, when this drops on Saturday, on Friday, three mass vaccination sites will open on Long Island. So uh, exciting stuff. We're getting getting people a lot more um, chance to get vaccinated. Um, but um, I'm sort of jumping into my sit rep before my quote, but that's OK. We'll get to the quotation. Um, we're sort of sitting on this plateau. And as I'll discuss a little bit later, um, what we're seeing as far as cases, we're seeing a disproportionate number of these in uh, in the younger uh, population. So in kids. So we'll, we'll make sure we discuss that. But let's start with our quotation. Um, and this is, again, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. And the reason I throw it out there is I, my whole hope is as we come out of this um, that we learn what went wrong and we learn um, what to do so that this never happens again. Um, and I know a lot of the discussion is about people who did what wrong. Um, I don't think we learn from that. Those people will probably not be here the next time around, um, but the lessons will be there. Um, the events will be there. The ideas about how we can do better the next time. So um, I just uh, want to throw that out there. I really do hope we learn from this. Um, I do hope it doesn't become about, you know, just about blame um, and take the focus off the fact that this was a horrible thing that happened. This still is a horrible thing that is happening, um, but we can respond better the next time, I do hope. So never miss an opportunity to vaccinate, never miss an opportunity to test, and never waste a vaccine dose. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're here on this plateau. Um, our plateau in New York is is not as low a plateau as I would like. Um, so we're sort of going against this with our vaccines. Um, but as I mentioned, children and COVID, this has become a very hot topic. Um, and the hottest uh, topic I think this last week is three feet versus six feet. Um, and I know I heard um, one of the physicians, um, scientists who was sort of discussing this, um, saying, oh, this is just a distractor. But, but let me actually go into the weeds in this because I actually want to say that my involvement with schools, camps, uh, different venues to get children sort of back into more of a normal situation, um, this actually is a critical issue. So what, what, what got this all um, being discussed? And there was a publication, Effectiveness of Three Versus Six Feet of Physical Distancing for Controlling Spread of COVID-19 Among Primary and Secondary Students and Staff, a Retrospective Statewide Cohort Study, and this was published in CID. Um, so one of the things I am going to say as I go through this is I do want our listeners, as painful as it is, to try to actually read this article because the headlines, I do not think, really match with what's in this article. So let me discuss a little bit about um, what this article um, contained. So they reported on 251 eligible school districts, so 537,336 students um, and 99,390 staff um, who attended in-person instruction during a 16-week period, um, and they gave us incidence rate ratios with 
confidence intervals. Um, now I'm going to focus on the students and not the staff, um, but there is data there on the staff. Um, so they reported, this is sort of their conclusion, that student case rates were similar in the 242 districts with greater than three feet versus greater than six feet of physical distancing between the students. Um, and they give us a, an IRR, an incident rate ratio of 0 0.891. Um, with a really wide confidence interval. Um, and the results were similar after they adjusted for community incidents. Um, that came in uh, 0 0.904 with, a, again, a wide confidence interval stretching from 0 0.6 all the way up to 1.325. And they concluded that they did not see any significant difference um, um, in the staff um, incident rate ratios. Um, and also, as they say here, with these wide confidence intervals, uh, they couldn't show that there was any significant benefit to six feet versus three feet. Now, let's, let's go a little bit um, into this because I think this paper will impact policy. Uh, so therefore, I think it's important that we spend a little time understanding how reliable this data is. Um, so first off, this is not any kind of a prospective control trial, um, but rather was a retrospective analysis of publicly available data uh, derived from case reporting to the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and they looked at publicly available district plans. So I want to make the point here. Um, this wasn't even an observational study. They actually didn't even go out and observe to see what was going on. Um, they basically looked at what were the published plans. There was no verification what was actually going on. Um, they just looked through the plans and then they looked at some publicly re reported um, case rates. So they looked and they said, okay, districts that permitted a minimum of greater than three feet in distancing, even if greater distances were preferred, they're going to classify them as um, the three feet group. Um, districts that allowed greater than three for some grades, um, but not all, those were all classified as greater than three, right? Now, schools, the only ones that were greater than six, schools that open in hybrid learning mode with requirements of greater than six feet in the hybrid model um, were classified as the greater than six feet um, physical distancing. Then what they tell us is of these over 500,000 students, they identified 4,226 cases. So of all these students, we are seeing um, reported positive cases to the, um, the department um, of health based Massachusetts Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education um, that they had um, a case rate of 0.8%, right? So this is a very small number. A um, couple things to also add, the majority of the campuses that did open had less than 80% of enrolled students on campus. Uh, they do comment on the fact that active surveillance was rare, right? Um, so we have to throw in what we learned from last time that the majority of cases um, in this um, age group are, are missed. Um, they also lumped all the schools together um, and based their analysis on, as I mentioned, publicly available plans. There was no verification of what was the actual um, practice. And then what they saw was this rate ratio of 0 0.9 for six feet um, over three, but this really wide um, confidence interval. Um, so I think the tough thing I had with this paper was this is falls into what I say of things that we want to be true or don't want to be true. Um, and I don't think that there was anything here in the data that really gave us clarity on this issue. Um, so what, what I did want to do was sort of bring people back to, I think, um, a paper that actually um, was a little bit better if you're giving us insight. Uh, when I looked at this paper and I said, people now want to say that we need three feet or three feet is fine compared to six feet. And the reason there's so much um, focus here is that most schools in our country, if six foot separation is required between the students, between the desks, that's going to prevent them from a full in-person opening, a sort of return to this full in-person um, class. Um, so there really was, I, I want to say, Sorry to the authors of that paper, but there was an excellent paper published in The Lancet back in June. And I, and I think we've spent some time on this before, but I want to sort of bring people back to it. Um, you know, it's amazing that something in June is, is old news, but um, physical distancing, face masks and eye protection to prevent person to person transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, a systematic review and meta-analysis, right? So this was back in the Lancet. Um, and the point this paper made 
um, which is really something consistent with what we've learned over over the years, is that there's a continuum to risk. There's no invisible barrier um, at six feet or at three feet. I still remember having a discussion with, uh, I think it was a reporter back in April who who really wanted to be within three feet of her friends and six feet seemed ex- excessive. Um, now, in medicine, um, you know, we talk about droplets, we talk about aerosols, we've looked at diseases like measles and laryngeal tuberculosis, where really an infected person comes into the office waiting room. Minutes later, just about every susceptible person is infected. Um, now, influenza, in contrast, where a mask, distance, good ventilation, really makes sitting across a room a much lower risk activity, Right. Um, and, and I know there was a lot of time spent, you know, is it airborne? What is an aerosol? Um, you know, and I, I think we need to be careful um, of sort of getting mired down in the, in the medical terminology. Um, and I think there were in some quarters, and there still actually continues to be in many quarters, challenges with science, science communication around this issue. Um, we've talked about larger droplets, um, which in some situations and some percent of them will travel more than six feet. So they don't all drop magically. Um, um, and some some virions, infectious virus particles, to use that as it's supposed to properly be used, I understand, um, they can actually be in those smaller size droplets. So, so nothing is black and white here. There are continuums here. Um, but this, I think this translates into the fact that if you have poor ventilation, um, the law of averages is such that a small percentage of um, these smaller um, size particles that might have um, virions in them are going to start to build up in a room. So um, if you go back to this paper, and I'm going to say, you know, not while you're driving, um, but this was a good read, you can actually really see a beautiful figure where they show that the absolute risk really does drop in that first meter. Um, So that 3.3 feet. by about 80%. Um, but then if you get out to about three meters, you're seeing you're getting down to about a 90% reduction. So you can see you get the most bang in that first meter, but you get even more in that second meter. So it's a continuum. Um, we've talked before about how a mask drops our risk by about 80, 85%. We've talked about eye protection being associated with um, another drop in risk. Um, and I know this study in Lancet didn't really spend much time on proper ventilation, but I think we can add that into the mix. Um, So I think as um, we hear that the CDC is continuing three feet versus considering three feet versus six feet, um, what's really being considered is a full plan. Um, If you have masks, if you have three feet, if maybe you put up um, plexiglass barriers, if you upgrade your ventilation system or have open windows, um, putting also into the equation community prevalence. Um, We do know that schools, we think we know, though we don't have a lot of active surveillance, that schools can be opened um, safely. Um, We also know they can be kept closed and we also know they can be opened unsafely. Um, So I think as we get into this decision, it's important to look at the science and balance our risks. Um, And as we get into our tail end about long COVID, I'm going to be talking a little bit about long COVID in children again, um, because this is getting more attention and we're getting more stories about what's happening there. All right, uh, let's move into testing. Testing is sort of a short section. I'm sort of um, a little bit dismayed at the drop in the amount of testing that is going on. Um, If you actually go to these mass vaccination sites and you start asking the volunteers and the people working there, hey, what were you doing before you came and started working here? Um, A lot of them were involved in the mass testing sites. Um, So we're seeing a shift of resources, a shift of focus, a shift of energy from testing to vaccinations. Um, And we still, if you look around, we're at a higher level now than we were during the quote unquote second peak of the summer in a lot of parts of our country. So we really have to continue having testing as part of our approach. Um, And there really was a lot of money in that last plan that just came out um, to have testing as part of an approach. So um, there's been a lot of good work done on this. We actually did some, I like to think it was good work. It's now published, I'll have to tweet that out to everyone. Um, But you can actually look at cases prevented, how much does it cost per case prevented, and particularly if someone else is paying for those testing bills, which is now what's supposed to be happening with this new stimulus bill, we can make testing part of a safe reopening plan. Active vaccination. Uh, We actually saw really encouraging data, and this was a big uh, discussion before. If you're going to approach a disease with a 
double dose vaccination strategy, how many of those people are really going to come back for that second dose? Uh, so we saw a bit of information from the CDC and the MMWR, COVID-19 vaccine, second dose completion and interval between first and second doses among vaccinated persons. United States, December 14, 2020, February 14, 2021. And this was impressive. Um, as per the C CDC data, only about 3% of individuals are reported as missing that second dose. Um, so this is, I have to say, very encouraging. Um, this may even be, I'm going to venture to say, even an overestimation because we know a lot of individuals, you know, maybe they went down to Florida, got that first dose, and then they came up to Massachusetts to complete their series. Is the tracking good enough to catch that they really got that second dose? Um, what we're seeing, um, I think, is a really good uptake of people who get that first dose getting that second dose. So um, I have to say this is, this is really encouraging. Um, the other thing I want to throw in here is something that we're getting more and more information about. We're hearing more and more confirmatory experiences of <clears throat> people with long COVID go ahead, get vaccinated, and actually feel significantly better. Um, you know, this is something I started to notice early in early in January. I was a little bit worried. Is this going to hold after that second dose? Um, after the second dose, it's holding, which is pretty impressive. Um, say my personal experience is probably about 30 or 40 percent of my patients. Um, my it was interesting. My, my wife was just asking me, you know, is it still holding? Um, and of course, today I, I got a call from one of my patients um, who works um, in um, in education. Really, a lot of difficulties, including, um, you know, well, really almost anything. Um, she seems, you know, the hair loss, the the fatigue. Um, pretty significant um, cognitive um, issues, the brain fog, really concerned about her ability to function. Um, and today the call was just about a rash. Um, and she said, boy, I really am continuing to improve. I'm continuing to feel better. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, we'll get maybe a little bit more ideas into why this is happening. Um, there, we have a couple of theories out there we don't know, um, but that that is definitely exciting to see vaccine as therapeutic. Um, we also have vaccine trials in children, and they're all up. They're getting filled. They're running forward. Um, we actually heard that some of the vaccine trials are looking um, at going as low as children as young as six months of age. Um, and this is fantastic. Um, I think we've talked about, you know, will we ever reach this herd immunity Um you know, if we if we don't have uh, vaccinations in our children, then it's going to be pretty challenging unless uh, Peter Hotez wins over the hearts and minds of every single adult. Um, passive vaccination. Um, this was an exciting, complicated, challenging last week, I have to say. Um, so this last week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, said it would limit distribution of BAM, lenivimab, monotherapy um, in a few of our states, California, Nevada, Arizona. Um, and this was due to high levels of um, variants, hate those variants, uh, that contained um, l 452R, right? So they've got a mutation that seems to be impacting the efficacy of BAM lenivimab, um, wanting us to switch over to cocktail treatment. Um, not only um, have we started to do that in those three states, um, but we've switched over um, almost all our sites, I have to say, here in, in the tri-state area. So by the time this drops on Saturday, I think almost all the sites will have successfully um, switched over. Um, United in research, all our home infusion, we are rapidly switching everything over to cocktails. And, and I, I think I'll sort of explain like, why are, why are we doing that? Why not just these three or four states? Um, we do not have the level of, of surveillance of the genetic sequence of the virus. Um, so it was actually, it's on a call, Deneen Volta, who's my boss um, at um, Optum Labs, United Health Group. And she said, Daniel, you know, if your mother was in one of these states that does not have good surveillance and she got COVID, would you want to give her the monotherapy or would you want to give her the cocktail? And, you know, so we'll call that the mother test. And the mother test was, no, I would want my mother to get the cocktail. I think everyone should get the cocktail. Clearly, um, and David Ho sort of gave me a heads up about this, we are seeing um, the sequences in New York City, maybe a third or more, and that's actually um, from March 10th when he emailed me, we're already having resistance mutations that would suggest um, a lack of efficacy to BAM, lenivimab. Um, 
and we're seeing increasing rates around. So it's really a switch over to cocktails. Um, I'm going to go even a little more detail here, right, is the ID Society of America has now embraced um, monoclonal antibody therapy. But what have they em embraced? It's very specific. They've embraced therapy with the Eli Lilly cocktail, with bamlanivimab and atesivimab. Um, based upon those phase three uh, trial results showing 87% reduction in progression um, and that um, impact on mortality as well. So this last week was a challenge, right? Because the Catholic hospitals were the first ones to have cocktails. So we were flooding them. We had some pretty bad experiences with people waiting six, seven hours, sort of a monoclonal antibody line to get the cocktails um, because we were not wanting them to get monotherapy with Bam Bam until everyone had switched over to cocktails. So Fortunately, I think we are, by the time this drops, we will have made the conversion across all over the place. So um, sort of tip my hat to everyone sort of switching and doing what needed to be done to make this happen. All right. Um, and now um, this is, I'm going to hopefully make this not as long as my other ones. We're going to spend a little bit of time on the tail phase before we go into our fundraiser and answer some emails. So I mentioned um, recently that um, things have been getting better and better with vaccination. Um, but one of the things that has not been getting better is we're seeing lots and lots of um, COVID positive uh, kits. Um, and now what's getting a lot of attention is not just what we heard from the UK in terms of numbers, but we're hearing more and more stories. We're hearing more and more focus on children getting COVID and then not getting better. Um, we don't know the exact percentages. Um, I think I mentioned before, I don't want to hang my hat yet on what percent of children at what age end up with long COVID, um, but it is clearly more than we want to get long COVID. Um, and the number of stories, the number of um, experiences that are being shared are growing. Um, so this is going to have to factor into that discussion. Um, I don't want to oversell this. I want to try to basic, basically say this is what the science is. Um, we know that children are at low risk of hospitalization. We know that children are at low risk of death. We know that children are at lower risk, seemingly, for long COVID. But though children are at lower risk, they're not at no risk. Um, so as we, we learn more and more about this, I think this needs to be part of that decision about letting the kids go back to school, letting the kids get back into all these activities, just realizing that you can't just say, oh, it doesn't matter if a child gets COVID um, because there can be consequences. So, all right, as promised, I didn't keep people too long, um, but I do want to bring people to um, sort of my vision that I that I am concerned about. So I'm going to encourage everyone to go to parasiteswithoutborders.com um, and help us continue to support the American Society of Tropical Medicine. Um, we're trying to create these scholarships, these um, annual meeting travel awards um, for we're hoping to bring three women um, from uh, economically challenged uh, parts of the world to the annual meeting, trying to sort of help push them forward. I think it's really critical that we don't leave the rest of the world behind. Um, what I fear is this sort of dystopian vision I have. It's December 4th, it's July 4th. Um, we're celebrating Independence Day in the United States. We have massive numbers of people vaccinated. Um, we're having our small gathering barbecues in the backyard, um, but still thousands of people are dying per day in many other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, as we move, I think at a really good um, pace here, towards vaccinating um, people here in the United States. Uh, I am glad to hear that we already have plans as we vaccinate um, people here to share those vaccines, to get those vaccines out to the rest of the world. So um, let's not just worry about ourselves. We're not safe until everyone's safe. Looking forward to understanding, Daniel, how vaccinating resolves long COVID. That's a surprise to me. Uh, email for Daniel. Daniel at microbe.tv. Martha, question regarding age and COVID vaccine dose. Does it seem that the elderly might need a larger dose than younger? If so, do you know of any plans to test this? Similarly, should younger people get a smaller dose? My elderly father has been asking about this. Would love to find out the current thinking. You know, it, it's always shocked me in medicine, right? And this is the difference between the pediatrician and the adult physician. You know, w once you turn 18, one size fits all. You know, you, you could be that 75 pound woman. You could be the 320 pound, um, you know, 
man or woman, I guess. Um, you, you know, it's really amazing to me that we don't individualize, that we haven't studied a lot of our medicines to really um, adjust. Some of them we have right now that we're using tocilizumab um, for people that escalate. We, we clearly use a weight-based dosing. Um, for our anticoagulation, we use a weight-based dosing. Um, when we're looking at some of our antibiotics, we're actually looking at how much an individual weighs and we're dosing you know, how many milligrams per kilogram. Um, most of our vaccines are one size fits all and the idea is we're going to overdose. Um, but then we end up with discussions like about vaccines. Oh, they work, they work better in the young, they're less you know, responsive in the older individuals. Um, but we already saw with flu shots, for instance, maybe adjusting um, the preparation or the amount um, actually results in more more protection. Um, so I think that that's a lesson we've learned from the influenza vaccine story, that it is worth looking at different doses, different formulations, um, definitely based upon a person's age, um, but also based um, maybe upon a person's size, if we think about it. Um, and I think that as we're more interested, more exciting of vaccines, I'm hoping we learn more about this. I um, actually remember one of our um, discussions when I was having my PhD was about really the difference in the immune system and the vaccine efficacy um, in children versus uh, the elderly, versus people in sort of between the two. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say elderly or older individuals, but um, no, I think this is an excellent question and these are unanswered questions. And if we keep seeing maybe uh, treatment, vaccine failures in people who are older, uh, it might make sense to actually use increased doses in those individuals and study that. Walter writes, is there any known downside to any of the anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike protein vaccines for older kidney patients who do not yet require dialysis. I imagine vaccination produces at least some antibodies against the ACE2 spike protein complex. That could engender cross-reactivity against ACE2 receptors. The heart, kidney, and lungs are rich in those. I noticed that kidney patients were not included in the original Pfizer, Biotech, or Moderna vaccine trials and have wondered why. Yeah, they weren't. That, that's a good good observation. Um, they have been clearly included in the millions of people that are now being vaccinated. So we have good experience in this population. Uh, they tend to be tolerating the vaccines very well. We're not seeing any safety concerns. So um, if someone has kidney problems, even if they're on dialysis, we're not seeing concerns. So dialysis, no dialysis. Um, if you've got a place to get that vaccine, go ahead and get that vaccine. All right. One more from Thomas. Our facilities are beginning to revisit policies for preoperative SARS-CoV-2 testing, as well as reconsidering wait times in our ORs after aerosol generating procedures. For roughly the last year, we've been testing all our elective surgical patients within 72 hours of their procedures and asking them to isolate following their testing until day of surgery to reduce both the risks associated with an infected patient coming to this hospital surgery center and spreading SARS-CoV-2, and more importantly, the risks of increasing complications with a pa were a patient to have pre-op uh, COVID-19, perioperative. Additionally, we have had various wait times after both intubation, ext extubation, or other aerosolizing procedures, depending on air exchange rates. Proposals are to, one, eliminate pre-op testing in fully vaccinated patients to decrease or eliminate wait times after AGPs if patients are either vaccinated or have tested negative. The latter certainly goes against our current practice since all elective cases for the last many months would have had negative pre-op tests and we currently do wait for the requisite number of air exchanges prior to opening the rooms up. Vast majority of the staff has been fully vaccinated since early to mid-February, so risk of serious disease in our staff shouldn't really be the concern. Since some facilities have 14-minute pre- and post-waits, you can imagine efficiency isn't what it was pre-pandemic. Admittedly, item one goes against your mantra, never miss an opportunity to test, but I suspect the risks are at least markedly reduced. Given the current CDC recommendations regarding travel for vaccinated people, it sounds like data is still lacking to definitively be say vaccinated individuals can't transmit to other people. Curious to if you and your crew have any thoughts on these proposed changes. Do you have any thoughts on if there is an ideal time to schedule a COVID-19 vaccination either before or after a planned elective surgery? We have administrators and high proclaiming patients shouldn't receive a vaccination for 14 days before or after 
a scheduled surgery. I've heard surgeons proclaim you could get a fever from the vaccine. It might mimic a surgical site infection. And similarly, others have worried about side effects mimicking COVID and leading to postponement. I want I tend to err on the side of never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. <laughs> so that was a lot there. That was like a that was like a TWIP email, right? Where yeah, we've got like oh, that's right. <laughs> So let, let me let me pick the winners out. Uh, maybe I'll go in reverse order and then I'll like remember as I go. Um, so one of the things that definitely has has been an issue is surgeons do not like us vaccinating anywhere around when they might be doing surgery, um, particularly the cancer surgeons. They're all worried that if we vaccinate, particularly with an mRNA vaccine, uh, particularly in the field, let's say you've got a woman who has um, you know breast cancer um, in her left breast, and you're going to stick an mRNA shot into the uh, the left deltoid, and then potentially have the enlarged lymph nodes that we we clearly see. Um, that might be an issue when they want to do lymph node dissection, sentinel um, lymph node um, sampling, all these other things. And that that actually is reasonable. Um, and this, this is complicated, right? So it can be very hard on a TWIV to give the full answer. But yeah, there certainly are circumstances where I would, um, I would defer that vaccine. I know that breaks my rule, but never miss a chance to immunize. Yeah, there, there are times when you're not missing the opportunity, you're moving that opportunity uh, to a different time. Now, we have started in the New York area giving the J&J &J vaccine to a lot of patients before they leave. I do not think you need to wait a full 14 days. Um, much seems to be a much lower incidence of fever and tolerance issues. So in this case, um, I actually have a patient right now. Um, she's in the hospital. Um, she had a biopsy for her breast cancer. Um, and uh, we're actually going to go ahead and um, give her the J&J &J vaccine um, in the opposite arm before she leaves. Um, and I think that this is going to have to be sort of an individual thought out. Um, but I, I actually would want not want there to be this hard and fast rule for any vaccine. If someone's planning on a hernia operation and they've got a chance to get a vaccine and it's 13, 12, 11 days before, I'm not sure we want to have... Um, too many barriers. We want to get those people vaccinated because unfortunately, when they come into a healthcare setting, we, sorry to say, have had um, exposure events. And so um, I think we want to be careful. We don't want to have rigid rules there. Now, the next is about testing. Hey, we have more and more testing ca uh, capacity. We have quicker turnaround. Those whole ideas about getting your, your test 72 hours ahead of time were in large part based upon testing delays. Um, if anything, I think we can ramp this up and have, um, you know, the, the day before um, get a test and have results available in time for that surgery. We really do not want people coming in um, bringing them into healthcare settings, uh, potentially exposing people who are immunocompromised who maybe wanted to get vaccinated but didn't have an opportunity to. I know we're all vaccinated, um, healthcare workers who wanted to, um, but a lot of our patients have not been vaccinated. And I think that's going to be an issue for a while, either through choice or because they have an issue with their immune system failing. So I think we still have a commitment to try to keep our healthcare settings as safe as possible. Um, it was related a story today, unfortunately, where um, one of my good friends, his son um, had a skiing accident. Uh, they went to a hospital near the ski mountain. Uh, they wanted to do a CAT scan um, because they were concerned about, about um, head trauma. Um, and uh, the dad asked, like, well, why is this taking so long? And they said, oh, we just had a person in the CT scanner with COVID. We're just going to give it a few more minutes before we put your son in there. Um, five days later, the son started feeling poorly. He started feeling poorly. The wife started feeling poorly. Um, that was the only exposure they could really think about was all that time spent in a healthcare setting. So we got to keep those places safe. Um, it's a small price to pay to continue to test to keep these places safe. Um, and not only is it a small price to say, I'm going to say it's going to destroy the confidence. Um, people are going to fear going to healthcare um, settings if we can't keep them safe for them. Um, I think that was most of it. Yep, I think that's great. <laughs> okay. All right, that's COVID-19 clinical update number 54 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. My pleasure as always and everyone, be safe. Um, we're coming to the end of this. Um, you do not want to get sick now. There's lots of virus out there. We're sitting on a pretty high plateau. Get vaccinated, don't get COVID. Stay positive, but stay negative. <laughs> 